177. Pietism. Chalcedon Position Paper, number 162, April 1993. Strictly speaking, pietism was a movement in German Lutheranism, although it soon spread to the English-speaking world and elsewhere. It had roots in late medieval religiosity, and it quickly revived in post-Reformation Roman Catholicism. Pietism regarded orthodoxy as, quote, dead faith, as rationalist, as, quote, knowledge without life, form without spirit, worldliness under the cloak of religion, and as lacking in spirituality. Censoriousness marked the pietists to a marked degree. They prided themselves on their emphasis on being born again, but they tended to strip regeneration of any intellectual and doctrinal content. The emphasis was on being born again, with no definition of any precise meaning, and zeal for the Lord. Because doctrine was regarded with suspicion as intellectual, the stress was primarily on feeling, on an emotional experience. In time, pietism displaced doctrinal teaching, catechisms and serious, solidly biblical preaching with constant emotional appeals to be born again or to practice various devotional exercises. The damage to the church was immense. The body of doctrine, systematic theology, a mission to every area of life and thought and more, all give way to an insistence on rebirth and emotional experiences. Not surprisingly, as Koppel S. Pinson's research in the 1930s showed, pietism weakened the church and strengthened the state. It was, in fact, an important source of nationalism. Pinson pointed out that modern nationalism has two sources. First, there was the secularizing force of the Enlightenment, and second, pietism. Because pietism reduced Christianity from its universal or Catholic meaning, it could not contend against the Enlightenment. For the Enlightenment, the state had replaced the Church as a Catholic institution, and pietism did not contend against this. It left to the Enlightenment the hope of a united world order, not in Christ, but in the world state. The emotionalism and the enthusiasm which pietism created were readily transferred to the state. The church became a peripheral institution. The church building began to give way in its permanency to cheap, shoddy buildings, while state buildings became the new Catholic palace churches of the world. The early church had built stone structures because it held the church to be Christ's palace and the sanctuary, his throne room. The church ceased to be God's governmental centre and became rather simply a rescue mission. At the same time, an assault was launched against doctrine and theology. Sinzendorf actually said that to seek an intelligent understanding of God and the faith made one an atheist. At a later date, Friedrich Schleiermacher wrote, Religion's essence is neither thinking nor acting, but intuition and feeling. In other words, the faith was reduced to pious gush. As a result, the nation took the place of the church. Christianity and nationalism became identical. Koppel S. Pinson, Pietism, a source of German nationalism, in Christendom, Volume 1, Number 2, Winter 1936. Page 275. Doctrine gave way to intuition and feeling. Gary R. Sattler could conclude that the belief in the soul's origin in God was one of the fundamentals of pietist anthropology. The emphasis shifted from God to man, from God's election to man's preparation of his heart. The soul was a spark of the divine image, it began to be affirmed that a Christian should allow himself to be killed rather than kill hoodlums who attacked him. After all, the Christian was saved, so he had no problem. 
but the hoodlum needed time to repent. Gary R. Sattler, nobler than the angels, lower than a worm. Lanham, Maryland, University Press of America, 1989, page 123. The pietists also stressed separating the sin from the sinner. They also derided pleasure in this world and life. Heinrich Müller's deathbed statement said in part, Not I, but my wretchedness and suffering will die. I do not know that in my whole life I have had a truly happy day in this world. Page 168 The pietists refused to enjoy food, sex, or life itself. They were very much in the line of late medieval ascetics and pietists. Not the glory of God, but the salvation of men, beginning with oneself, was a concern of pietists. F. Ernest Stöffler, The Rise of Evangelical Pietism, Leiden, Netherlands, Brill, 1971, page 55. Systematic and thoughtful Bible study gave way very early to an intuitional and charismatic reading whereby the reader, a quote, prophet, end quote, could stand up and shout, Thus saith the Lord to me. Ibid, page 80. Illuminism was very much a part of Pietism. It had medieval roots and, in the Reformation, was represented by men like the notable Sebastian Castello. Page 176. Having abandoned a God-centred faith, these pietists gravitated to non-theocentric views, and rationalism was a key one. Germany, the centre of post-Reformation pietism, was also the first centre of higher criticism, rationalism and modernism. Some of the pietists discouraged Bible study. F. Ernest Stöffler, German Pietism During the 18th Century, Leiden, Netherlands, Brill, 1973, page 161. In 19th century America, a prominent evangelist held that too much Bible in preaching threw cold water on the congregation. At the end of the 20th century, the church is a shambles because of Pietism. It is people centered rather than God-centred. Congregations actually hold that they, rather than God, should be pleased with the preaching. It will not do to strengthen or stress the institutional church when the need is for a God-centred faith and church. Pietism from the beginning was implicitly antinomian. It did not want theology nor God's law. It demanded preaching to the heart, not teaching the believer the whole counsel of God. While there have been exceptions to these generalizations, the fact remains that the center of church life was shifted from the triune God to the heart of man. There has been another facet of pietism, Roman Catholic and Protestant alike. All too commonly, pietism has been all too eager to damn other churches or communions rather than to fulfil our Lord's great commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. It becomes a virtue to see faults in other communions, however true, rather than to bring every area of life and thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. Pietism leads to the deformation of the Christian life. In one court case, I was called as an expert witness to the defence of some street preachers, my testimony was cited by the judge in his favourable verdict. One of the street preachers, after the hearing ended, began to harangue me as an unconverted person. Why? Well, he said, I had not witnessed to Jesus while on the stand, nor tried to convert the judge. I explained that I had only one legitimate purpose on the stand, namely to testify to precedents in history and to the history of relevant laws as well as the biblical and constitutional aspects. He understood not a word of what I said. Quote, head religion, end quote, was useless, if not evil, and, quote, heart religion, end quote, was alone valid. 
sad to say, this street preacher was an intelligent person who had chosen boorishness, loudness and ignorance as marks of true piety and holiness. His success, I learned later, was minimal and his censoriousness maximal. Pietism, Catholic and Protestant, has given us too many such people. They believe that their pietism gives them a private pipeline to God. God says to all such persons, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set thee in order before thine eyes. Psalm 50, verse 21 God will, in his own time, re-establish his church upon his Son. All other foundations shall fail, 